a time to thank and praise God. Let's talk to God together. Lord God, Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us safely to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power so that we will not dishonour you or be overcome by the hardships of life. And in all we do today, direct us and help us to do your good will. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hello, welcome to our English book for today. I'm Jim. We're going to be looking at three words, mystery, toil, and minister. Our first word is the noun mystery. A mystery is something that is not understood, is not known, remains unexplained, has been kept secret. Sometimes we say something is a mystery if it's puzzling. A mystery is also a story in which strange things happen that are not explained until the end. Other words with a similar meaning include puzzle or secret. Our first example for mystery, many people in Scotland say there's a giant animal which lives in a lake in the north of the country. Some people claim that they have not only seen this creature, but have taken photos of it. Around the world, this has become known as the mystery of the Loch Ness Monster. But the locals just call the mysterious creature Nessie. Our next example for mystery. Scientists still do not know much about the oarfish. First described by Peter Ascansius in 1772, the oarfish can grow to a length of 12 metres, but is rarely seen by humans as it normally lives at depths of between 150 to 300 metres. However, over the last 10 years, more and more oarfish have been frightening locals in the US, Mexico and Japan as they appear on the surface. Scientists admit this new behaviour is a mystery. We're going to have discussion together now. Which of these do you think is the greatest mystery? So, first, who was it? that made the statues on Easter Island? Or what caused the Tunguska explosion in Russia that occurred on June 30, 1908? This was a 12 megaton explosion that flattened over 2,150 square meters of forest and destroyed approximately 80 million trees. Or you could choose what happened to the missing Malaysian Airlines flight MH370. Or is the Loch Ness Monster real? You have two minutes. Great, we're going to move on to our next word, which is the verb toil. If people toil, they work very hard. They work continuously. The work they do is exhausting. It is difficult and strenuous. So we have an example for toiling. For over 40 years, miners in the African country of Burkina Faso have been toiling in a large granite quarry located in the capital city of Ouagadougou. The men smash rocks into smaller chunks with ham hammers and chisels, 
while the women carry the granite rock up the steep mine walls. Each worker is paid two euros per day. Woo, that's not much, is it? Example two for toil. Reporter, Mr. Misha Ketchell, says that hundreds of workers toiled for over 10 years to build the Suez Canal in order to correct, connect the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. Work to cross the 193 kilometers of Egyptian desert began in September 1859 and was finally completed on the 17th of November, 1869. Now, finally, we have our last word, which is minister. We use the word minister in two main ways. A minister is a person who performs religious duties. Example, you can have a minister of religion or a priest, or you can have a minister is also a person who is in charge of a particular government department. For example, in New South Wales, we have the Minister for Education, Ms. Sarah Mitchell, and the Health Minister is Brad Hazard. Now, we can also use the word minister as a verb. So as a verb, the word minister means to serve other people. It means to help people who are under your care. Example one, New South Wales Education Minister, Miss Sarah Mitchell, says some schools in New South Wales will begin trialling flexible school hours. She said that possible changes could include having a 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. school day or extending after school care. New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet says that the current school day was first introduced back in the 1950s and may not suit the lives of busy working families today. Example two for minister. A minister is a person who has been authorised by a church to perform activities such as preaching, teaching, weddings, baptisms and funerals. The word minister comes from Latin and means servant or attendant. We have time for another discussion now. Which of the following people is a servant, do you think? A pastor, a policeman, or the prime minister? We have two minutes to discuss that with each other. A time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, give us the grace to receive your word, the understanding to know what it means, and the desire and ability to do what you say. We pray this through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible reading is taken from Colossians chapter 1, from verse 22 to 29. But now, through the death of his son, God has brought you back in order to bring you into his presence, holy, pure, and faultless. If indeed you continue in the faith and not be moved away from the hope that comes from the good news of Jesus that you have heard and accepted. This good news has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have been made a servant of this good news. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and in my body I am completing what is still lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. 
I have become its servant by God's command, which he gave me to present to you the word of God in all its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden, but is now being revealed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among all the peoples of the earth the glorious riches of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Jesus Christ. For this purpose, I toil and struggle with all his energy, which powerfully works in me. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, good morning, everyone. And it's good to see everyone sitting in that half of the room again. Uh, we're continuing our series in the, uh, the letter of Colossians, and it's a very uh, full letter. I think it's very dense, lots of ideas, lots of truth, and it takes a lot of thinking. And today in particular, I think, is quite a difficult part of the letter to, to understand. So how about we begin by uh, praying and prepare ourselves? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are ever present with your people and deep in your heart you long for us to know you as you are, clearly, in a way that removes all our misunderstandings and distractions, our fears, our, our guilt and our shame. And so we ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would really help us to understand what it means to be a minister of Jesus Christ, a servant, a happy servant. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, this morning I'm going to uh, begin by showing you some pictures of three different ministers. I'll show you the pictures, and then I would like you to vote on who you think is the most important minister out of those three. Now, I think you probably know what the answer should be. But let's go through these. Thank you, George, the first one. The first minister is this guy. He is the New South Wales Health Minister, Mr Brad Hazard. Is he the most important minister? Or number two, thank you, George, here is the Prime Minister, Mr Scott Morrison. Here's number three. Thank you, George. Your... <laughs> Sorry, why are you laughing? <laughs> Friends, here is your local friendly minister of religion. Now, I won't tell you his name because you should know his name, or at least I hope you know his name. Now, which one of these is the most important minister? It's your time to vote. Who says number one? The New South Wales Health Minister, put your hand up. Put your hand up if you think number one, Brad Hazard, is the most important minister. Come on, guys. He's a very important person. I mean, over the last two years of COVID lockdown, the decisions this guy made has really affected your life for better or worse. Surely this guy is a very important minister. Okay, who voted for? Number two, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who says he is the most important minister that we know. Anyone putting up their hands for number two? Gee, not many. But again, friends, you know, this is the Prime Minister. He is the, the leader of all 25 plus million people in Australia. And so what he decides affects the lives of many, many people. And his importance actually is even in the title, Prime Minister. Prime means first. So this man is the first, the biggest minister in Australia. But only one of you voted for him. Well, that only leaves the last guy. Who says number three is the most important minister? Your local friendly church minister. Put your hands up so I can see. 
Ah, I think I'll just go home now. That's fantastic. Now, I know, I know when you look at this guy, he doesn't look all that impressive or, or influential when you first look at him, right? I mean, he can't lock you down for seven days. He can't make you stay at home like the New South Wales health minister did. I mean, I can't even do that to my children anymore. And my decisions don't affect the whole of Australia like the Prime Minister does. You know, his decisions affect all 25 million people. Your local minister of religion doesn't affect the lives of that many people. I mean, our church is just not that big yet. Yet. And yet, according to the Word of God, the Bible, God says the most important minister you will ever meet is your local, friendly church minister. That is the most important minister you will ever, ever meet. And that is because that minister serves Jesus. That minister serves the risen Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, you know, through whom and for whom all things were made and who is also drawing all things back to God through the blood he shed on the cross. That is who your local church minister serves. And that's why he is the most important minister you will ever meet. More than Brad Hazard, more than the prime minister. And really, here in Colossians, you know, what Paul is doing is sharing his heart here in chapter 1. You know, he really shares his heart of what it means to be a minister of the risen Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to look at what he says about what it means to be a minister, a servant of the risen Jesus. And Paul says this, thank you, George. He says, this good news has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and I, Paul, have been made a servant or a minister of this good news. Friends, here the Apostle Paul says that he has been made a minister, a servant of the good news of Jesus. And what I really like about even in this little section is Paul seems to know that it's not all up to him. Even in this sentence, you can tell that Paul knows that this is not all up to him. He seems to know that he is a small part of what God is doing in all creation under heaven. Paul knows this. Now, I know that Paul is a very special person. If you remember Acts, when we looked at Acts, on the road to Damascus, the risen Lord Jesus appeared to Paul and gave him a very specific job to do, to be the apostle to the non-Jewish world. That's a big job. But even though Paul was given that great task to do, he does not do that task on his own. I mean, even here in Colossians, He didn't start that church. It was Epaphras. And Paul hasn't even been to that city yet. You see, Paul didn't work alone. Paul knows that he is a small part of a much bigger thing that God is doing in all creation under heaven. He knows he is part of a larger group of ministers, of servants of the Lord Jesus who work together to proclaim the good news of Jesus in many different parts of the world and in many different ways. And if you go home this afternoon and just start to read some of the letters that Paul wrote to the different churches, you'll see that right at the end of almost all the letters, he's always thanking people. He's thanking his co-workers who work with him. He is thanking, you know, almost always he thanks other ministers of Jesus, other servants of Jesus who served with him throughout the whole world spreading the good news of Jesus. 
And so as you read these letters, you will hear names like this. Some of them are very strange. Priscilla and Aquila, Andronicus and Junia, Urbanus and Statius, Tryphena and Tryphosa, Persis, Rufus, Asinocritus, Phygian, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas. And of course, we must never forget those great servants of the risen Jesus, Barnabas, Mark, and Luke. You see, Paul is not on his own. He is always working with other servants of the risen Jesus. And together they proclaimed the good news of the risen Jesus. And really this shows us that, you know, being a minister is not a one-man show. And it's not a one-woman show either. Because God has decide, designed us for Christian fellowship. And by Christian fellowship, I don't mean, you know, morning tea and having a, a nice cup of tea with your fellow Christians. That's a nice thing to do. A really nice thing to do. And I'm really, really happy that next week we are starting morning tea with tea, coffee and food. It's a great thing. But that's not the fellowship I'm talking about. The Christian fellowship I think Paul is talking about is Christians, servants, standing shoulder to shoulder, working together to spread, to proclaim the good news of Jesus, to serve people, to serve God's people in many different ways, in many different contexts. Like right here in church, here at Campsie or as part of the other churches in Sydney and Australia, and working with all the people around the world who are God's people, even in countries like the Ukraine and, and Russia. Yes, even Russia. The ministers of Jesus work together to extend the kingdom of God. You see, friends, today the ministers of Jesus, just like they did 2,000 years ago, work together with other servants, other ministers of the risen Jesus. Wherever they are, whatever they do, whatever country, whatever race, whatever nationality, whatever age, the ministers of Jesus work with other ministers of Jesus to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Friends, that is the life of a minister of Jesus Christ. That's what it looks like. It's not a one-man, one-woman show. We work together, serving Jesus, serving each other. And friends, this service is not always easy. Look at these words. Thank you, George. Paul says this, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and in my body I am completing what is still lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. And Paul says that serving Jesus is not always easy. You know, it's not always smiles and no tears. And sometimes it's the opposite. It feels like it's all tears and no smiles. Paul knows how difficult it can be to be a minister of Jesus, a servant of Jesus. But in his life and in his experience, no matter how hard things got, he was still able to rejoice. Well, why? Well, because everything that happened to him happened for the good of those that he served. And friends, life is like that sometimes. You know, sometimes it's easier to do things for people who are far away from you than it is to do things for people who are close to you. Sometimes it's actually easier to suffer for others far away than it is to suffer for those who are close to you. I'll give you an example. Who has children here? Well, if you have children, you will know 
that it's much easier to be patient and kind with the children of other people than it is to be patient and kind with your own children. It's true. I don't know why it's true, but it is true. That's how life works. And so it is with Paul. Paul is able to rejoice as he suffers for other people far away who are not close to him as he serves and prays them. And I love how Paul describes it here. He says, you know, in my body I suffer what is still lacking in Christ's afflictions. That's a very strange sentence. In what way does a minister of Jesus suffer what Jesus suffered? What's he talking about? Well, I think that's another way of saying that what a minister of Jesus does today is continues what Jesus started 2,000 years ago. That's what he's saying. What a minister of the risen Jesus does today, really continues what Jesus began 2,000 years ago. And this means that the risen Jesus is with his ministers, with his servants, working with them, empowering them to do his work. And that work sometimes requires hardship, but it always produces joy. That too is the life of a minister of Jesus. Hardship and joy at the same time. And friends, all this comes from a life-changing truth that the Apostle Paul experienced for himself and he had the honour to share with other people. Look at these words, thank you, George. Paul says this, I've become its servant by God's command, which he gave me to present to you the word of God in all its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden, but is now being revealed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among all the people of the earth, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, friends, have you ever had good news that you wanted to share with everyone but you weren't allowed to tell them? Has it ever happened to you? Well, a few years ago, there was a couple that I knew who, you know, really wanted to have a baby and they had tried for a long, long time and they couldn't fall pregnant. And then one day, they rang me, invited me to come to their house and they said, guess what? We're expecting a baby. And they were so happy, and I was happy for them. And then right at the end, they really surprised me. They said, oh, by the way, don't tell anyone yet. Not for a couple of months. Now, friends, do you know how hard it is not to tell anyone for a couple of months? And you know what happens to you when you are finally told you are allowed to tell the whole world the good news? You know what happens to you? You tell everyone. You tell people who are interested and you tell people who are not interested. It doesn't matter. You just tell as many people as you can because you now are allowed to share this mystery with everyone. And that was Paul's joy. That's the joy that Paul experienced. He got to tell everyone the good news of Jesus. He told people who were interested and he told people who weren't interested. He just told as many people as he could the good news of Jesus, this mystery of God hidden for many years but now being revealed by God through his ministers, his servants. And friends, what is this great mystery that is now being revealed all around the world? Well, look at these verses. Thank you, George. 
Paul says this, God has chosen to make known among the peoples of the earth the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Friends, what does Paul say are the riches of this mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, I want you to look very closely at these words. Thank you, George. Because God's mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, let me ask you, is Paul describing something in the future? Or is he describing something that happens now in the life of God's people? Well, I think that Paul is describing both. The hope of glory, I think, obviously means what we will experience when the risen Jesus returns. That is the hope of glory. But in this phrase, I think Paul is also describing what happens to Christians now. He is talking about Christ in you Today, that's what he's saying. That's the mystery. Christ can live in you today. And in the future, you will live with him. You see, this phrase that Paul uses is about what we can experience now and what we will experience into eternity. And I don't think that Paul is talking about two different things here. He's actually saying the same thing. He's saying in this life we live with Christ in us. We begin that life with him. And in eternity the same thing continues. We will continue to live our lives with Jesus in our lives. It's the same thing, just bigger, just better. We will experience that life with Jesus more openly without any restrictions, limitations or distractions. We will experience the full glory of Christ in you today. And Paul teaches us here that this precious life with Christ takes effort. It needs to be carefully taught, learned and practised every single day. Look at what he says, thanks, George. He says, Jesus is the one we proclaim, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Jesus Christ. For this purpose, I toil and struggle with all his energy, which powerfully works in me. Now, friends, if you're a follower and student of Jesus, what is your life all about? What is your goal in life? And how do you know if you're making progress towards that goal every day? How do you know? Well, that's what Paul is talking about here. Because Paul knows that becoming like Jesus, becoming more mature as a Christian, doesn't happen to you automatically. You know, it's not enough to come to church once a week and expect that God would click his fingers and zap, boom, you're a different person with different feelings and different thoughts and different dreams and different priorities. That's not how it works with God. Not usually, anyway. Instead, Paul has learned through his life that becoming more like Jesus requires teaching. It requires warning. It requires listening. It requires wisdom. But friends, in our society today, these four things are not very popular. They're not. You know, many people just don't want to listen. 
Many people think they know everything. People don't want to know. People laugh at God's wisdom that he has shared with people for thousands of years. And if you ever warn anyone, whoa, watch out, because people will attack you for warning them and they will call you all sorts of names. That is the society we live in. But Paul knows that living with Christ in you requires effort. It requires work. It requires energy, struggle, and even toil. It requires work on our part. And so it doesn't sound easy. And it's not. But friends, the good news is that energy that we need to grow to become more like Jesus does not come from us. It doesn't come from inside of us. It is something that Christ in us does in us. That power, that wisdom, that teaching, that leading that we need all comes from Christ in you, working in you to make you more like Jesus. That is the life of a minister of Jesus. Look at how Paul describes it. Thank you, George. And I think this is one of the most important verses in the Bible. Listen to what he says. For this purpose, I toil and struggle with all his energy, which powerfully works in me. Now, friends, according to Paul, who works here? Who's working in the life of a minister to enable that minister to do the work that God wants them to do? Who works? Is it Paul? Or is it God? Well, which is it? Well, in these verses, Paul says he works, he toils and struggles. And God works in him at the same time. And that is the life of a minister of Jesus. The minister works, God works at the same time. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, how much do I need to work and how much does God work? I mean, is it, you know, like 50-50? 50% God, 50% us? Or maybe it's 99% God and only 1% us. But maybe it's 1% God and 99% God. What does Paul mean? Well, an old minister of mine taught me this wonderful truth. He said, look, it's 100% God. It's 100% you at the same time. That's the life of a minister. 100% God, 100% you at the same time. Now, friends, you might be sitting there thinking, really sorry for your local friendly church minister. You might be sitting there going, oh, man, I'm a, look, I'll pray for you, buddy. You've got a lot of responsibility. I mean, you've got to preach the word. You've got to warn people. You've got to grow in knowledge and wisdom. And you've got to do all this stuff. It's, it's, it's really hard. Look, tell you what, I'll stand over here and I'll make sure I pray for you as you be a minister of Jesus. And this is the way many people think about it. They think that the minister is the guy up the front. Now, if you are thinking like that, and I hope that you're not, but if you are, let me show you a verse that Paul wrote to another church in Corinth at about the same time that he wrote Colossians. And Paul says this to Christians in Corinth, 
And he says these words to us today. Look at this, George. Listen to what he says. He says, so follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus Christ. You see, here in Colossians chapter 1, Paul's not just telling us about his life. He's not just just talking about his life so that we'll know what it's like and maybe pray for him. I mean, he wants them to pray for him, but that's not why he's doing it. He's doing something else. He's describing his life to teach them to follow his example, to learn how he lives his life as a minister, as a servant of Jesus, because we are all ministers and servants of Jesus. And so Paul wants to teach them how to be ministers of Jesus with him. Serving, teaching, warning each other, growing in wisdom, becoming more like Jesus, and learning how to use the power of Christ in us. That is what Paul wants for each and every servant of Jesus sitting in this room. That's you, by the way, if you are a follower of Jesus. And these things are true in Paul's minds because he knows that everything that he has talked about happens to you when you begin to arrange your life around the good news. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ in us. Jesus Christ, our hope of glory. Friends, welcome to the Minister's Club. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have called some to do special things but you call and invite everyone to be a servant of the most beautiful person in this universe, your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for what Paul has shared with us. And we pray, Lord, that you too will make us people who are growing in maturity, who are growing in wisdom, who speak the truth humbly and calmly, who are learning how to live with Christ in us because that is what our future holds forever. Father, please open our eyes to all the things that you want for us and that you have planned for us through the death and resurrection of your Son. And Lord, we ask this in his name. Amen. Now, friends, we have one question. Thank you, George. This is a very general question. Now, what has God said to you today? Maybe it's one thing, multiple things. What is, how has God spoken to your soul today? What has he taught you? Okay, with the people around you, five minutes to talk, and then we'll come back together. Enjoy. Enjoy. Uh, It's time for us to pray together, and we are going to pray for two things this morning. The war in the Ukraine and the floods in Australia. Firstly, the war in Ukraine. A few weeks ago, both Jews and Christians living in the Ukraine began to pray Psalm 31 together. And they have continued to pray this psalm ever since. This morning, we are going to join them in praying through this psalm by watching a video that members of the Church of Christ, our Saviour, in Kiev recorded this week. Please enjoy this listening to the voices of our Christian brothers and sisters in the Ukraine, both young and old, as they pray. And the words of Psalm 31 appear at the bottom of the screen. Let's pray with them.
для дорогим та хору псалом Давиду. На тебе надіюся, Господи, хай не буду повік за соромою. Визволь мене в своїй правді. Не вели своє ухо до мене, скоро мене порятуй. Встань для мене могутньою скелою, дом твердий, щоб спасти мене. Я зненавидів всіх, хто шанує повбаних марних. Я ж надіюсь на Господа. Я буду радіти та тішитись в Твоїй милості, що побачив Ти горе моє, що приглянувся до Господа до моєї душі. І мене не віддав в руку ворога, на місці розлоги поставив Ти ноги мої. Помилив мене, Господи, бо тісно мені, від горя вже виснажилось умайоване, душа моя і нутро моє. Бо скінчилось життя моє в смутку, а роки мої у квилінні. Моя сила спіткнулася через мій гріх, і виснажились мої кості. Я в усіх ворогів своїх став посміховищем, надто сусідом своїм. І страхіттям знайомим моїм, хто бачить на дворі мене, утікають від мене. Я забутий у серці, немов той набіжник. Став я немов та розбита посудина. Бо чую багато шептання, страхання навколо, як змовляються разом на мене. Вони замишляють забрати мою душу. А я покладаю надію на тебе, о Господи, я кажу, ти мій Бог. В твою руку кладу свою долю. Ти ж визволь мене від руки ворогів моїх і моїх переслідників. Засяй світлом свого обличчя на твого раба. Спаси мене у своєму милосерді, Господи. Не дай мені осоромитись, адже я кличу до тебе. Нехай осоромляться нечестиві і змовкнуть у шоолі. Нехай заніміють обманливі уста, які зухвали зі зневагою, наговорюють на праведника. Яка ж велика твоя доброта, яку ти приготував для тих, що тебе шанують та на тебе покладаються і виявляєш її перед усіма людськими нащадками. Ти їх у заслоні обличчя свого заховаєш від людських тенет. Ти їх від лихих язиків у наметі сховаєш. Благословений Господь, що вчинив мені милість чудову свою в оборонному місці. А я говорив у своїм побентеженні. Я відрізаний сперед очей твоїх. Та дійсно, ти вислухав голос благання мого, коли я до тебе взивав. Любіть Господа, усі святі Його. Стереже Господь вірних, а гордому злишком відплачує. Будьте сильні, і хай буде міцне ваше серце. Усі, хто надію покладає на Господа. Псалом 31. In Psalm 46 we read these words of encouragement and comfort. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Let's pray for those affected by the floods in Australia. Almighty God, creator and preserver of our world, we ask you to hear our humble prayers for everyone that has been affected by the devastating flood waters throughout southeastern Queensland and across the state of New South Wales. We pray for all those threatened by flood waters in city, coastal and rural areas. Grant safety to the thousands of residents under evacuation orders. In your mercy, bring relief to affected areas and protect both life and property. We pray for the sick, the injured and the homeless. Have compassion on those who grieve the loss of loved ones. In the midst of suffering, Comfort men, women and children according to their needs. Give courage and hope in the midst of despair. Through the generosity of governments and individuals, provide a future for those who are experiencing loss and desperation. Grant wisdom to those who are assisting, especially government leaders, our state emergency service 
our Australian Defence Force, other emergency workers and aid agencies. And by your gracious hand, rebuild communities where men, women and children are nurtured with care and love. We particularly pray for those Christian ministers and the congregations who are serving the communities affected by flooding. By your grace, enable and equip them to be faithful servants in the midst of hardship and help them to be gentle witnesses of the good news of Jesus. At this time, may those without genuine peace turn back to you and find true hope in your son Jesus. We ask all this in the name of the risen Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, as we close today, we're going to bless one another by saying the words that you can see there on the screen. Together. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look straight at you and give you peace. Amen. Enjoy your morning tea.